I'm the president of Americans for Democratic Action. We are all in for Jackie Goldberg. Right here, right here, this region is ground zero for one of the most important battles. You know, there's many important battles. We have to save our planet. We have a lot of things. We have to save our election, the election integrity. We have to save our public schools. And ground zero for the struggle against the corporate-owned charter schools is right here. And they elected the last school board. They spent a ton of money to elect people, including a felon, you know, and um, and they put in a, a, a superintendent who is a, uh, he's a, a head of a big corporation. He's a he's not an educator. He wants to apply business solutions to something that really shouldn't have business solutions. And so we have an opportunity to to elect a champion who is gonna who's been fighting for progressive for everything that we hold dear as progressives her entire life. This is a great gift that we have. It's not like we have a situation where there's somebody who's kind of tolerable that we want to kind of help get it. We have somebody we absolutely love who stands for everything we stand for, and the battle to take back our schools happens right now, and it happens with Jackie Goldberg, and here she is. So let me, uh, first of all, thank all of you, but particularly uh, our hosts here, Jan. Mm -hmm. uh, my car actually drives almost by itself here <laughs> because of the number of events they hold every year here for really good causes. So I just say, Jan and Jerry, <laughs> I wish, but not yet. Um, let me say, though, in all seriousness, this is a very interesting moment in time. Uh, following the teacher strikes, you know, starting in West Virginia, and then through the red states, right? I mean, we're not talking about progressives here. We're talking about Oklahoma, all right, Arizona, uh, you know, and now we've got up north, we've got uh, Oakland. Madeira is taking a vote. Uh, their teachers are taking a vote. Fresno teachers are taking a vote. Why is this going on? Well, it's going on because we've had several decades of, an, of attempts to try to destroy public education. And it took them a while how to figure it out, the, the billionaire privatizers. They, their goal is, and it has been from the very beginning, and they're not even <clears throat> really quiet about it. Their goal is about a trillion dollars a year is spent on public education, K-12, throughout the United States, and they want it to be profitable. They don't like the idea that schools are not profit centers. They want it to be profitable. So they latched on to something they did not create, but they have created the legislation that has created it, and that is the charter school movement. Now, originally, the charter school movement was proposed by AFT president Al Shanker because he said, you know, what we need is to have an ability to experiment to try new teaching techniques, to try different uh, grade levels in the same school, to, to experiment because we've had many years of effort and we have not closed the achievement gap. He did that about 30 years ago. And then we had Diane Ravitch, who was hired by the Bush administration, and who read his stuff and thought, what a great idea and began with No Child Left Behind and began with creating charter schools but I will say one thing about Diane Ravitch and Al Shanker. They both found out it was a bad idea, and they have both, until he died, been in the leadership of opposing it. Now, why? I mean, what's really wrong with the idea of schools that have freedom from some of the millions of rules that we have in the state and in school districts? Actually, probably not much. The problem is, is that these are private schools publicly funded. They are not public schools. They claim they are, but they really aren't. And here's how you know they aren't. They select themselves to be the board. Nobody votes for them. They don't run. They don't have any way of recalling them if you don't like what they're doing. They can decide how to spend the money any way they want. They are not ruled by the government. And, and many of them are just fine. I, I had a chance. I taught at UCLA eight years after I got out of the assembly in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies, preparing teachers to teach. 
And during the Great Recession, no districts were hiring, and so all of my interns ended up in charter schools for two of the eight years I was there. So for two years, I was in 35 charter schools a week, which opened my eyes to what's really going on. Some of them, two of them, really incredible. One in Westchester and one uh, in the Valley. Unbelievable. Fabulous. I would have put any kid I've ever known in one of those schools. Almost all the rest of them were not really any substantially different from the schools near them that they were drawing kids from. And about five of the 35 were so terrible, I actually took my teachers out of them because they weren't going to learn to teach under the conditions in those five schools. So you have a real range. It's not all one thing. And then there are the parents. When you say to the parents, why did you make that decision? Well, it's very simple. If you starve the public schools so that the resources for the schools go down and the class sizes go up, many parents will look around and say, well, gee, if the charter school has a smaller class size, I'm going to put my kid in a charter school. Do I have a problem with that? Absolutely not. It's a parent's decision looking out for their kid. What I have a problem with is the legislation in Sacramento, which means that 100% of the money goes with the kid. Now you say, that makes sense. If the kid goes, he takes all the money, or she takes all the money. No, it doesn't make sense. The principal didn't get fired at that school. We're still paying for the principal. If the roof leaks, we're still fixing the roof. The lights still are on. We're paying the light bill. The water and gas still have to be paid. If there's a problem on the playground that needs to be fixed, it has to be repaired. Only now you have less money to do it because the state does not backfill fixed costs. If they backfilled fixed costs of a school, when a child left, there would be no harm to the school that they left from. But that's not what's happening. So people ask me during the strike, how is it possible that we have a nurse only one day a week. Well, it was this gradual starving of these schools. So you have them five days a week, and then eight kids leave your school, so you say, well, we can't afford the nurse anymore, so we go to four days a week. And then a year or two later, you're now down 17 more students, so now we're going to three days a week. And then eventually, you're down to one day a week. And, the, and But it, see, it's like the frog in the boiling water. It happened in smallish increments, one school at a time, and eventually, the results of it was, is that we wake up one day and we find out that not only has Prop 13 undermined funding for public education, but either intentionally or unintentionally, I don't care, at the state level, they've created a system in which another system is undermining funding for public education. And that's the charter system. Now, that's not anything a parent did. It's not anything a parent caused when they say, I want a smaller class size for my kid. So we don't have any problem with parents making these choices. We have a problem with the outcome of these choices based on the current legislation. And so one of the things I am running to do is to keep there from being four charter elected people on the seven member LA school board. <laughs> Okay. They did the last budget, which allowed for no way to prevent a strike. Okay, That strike was not inevitable. If they had picked X Kim, I can never pronounce her name, but she's a wonderful deputy superintendent who should be superintendent of LA Unified. If they had picked her, she would have negotiated. We would not have had to have a teacher strike to get the things that we got. Because she actually understands the system and the budget. But... Buechner wanted to strike. You could tell that really from the beginning by his remarks to the teachers. I mean, he took a group of teachers in the teachers' union who were maybe 70, 85 percent kind of together and made them 100 percent together. Okay. I mean, he really did. He drove them into each other's arms. And turned out for the strike, that was a pretty good thing. So in addition to which, the district, and particularly Buechner and Melboy and a couple of others, were shocked at the response by the community. They, honest to God, did not believe that literally thousands of parents and community members would stand in the rain with their teachers. You know, they did not predict that. And that's why, and that's why you get a 5-1 vote on the board.
prepared to ask Sacramento to have a moratorium on charters, which, by the way, I don't think will happen. But nonetheless, it forced them to realize that the teachers and the nurses and the uh, other folks that are in UCLA, the librarians, were not alone. Not only were they not alone, but <coughs> parents opened up their houses. I was at a couple of places picketing in the rain, and there were so many parents that we had to go around the school. We couldn't just go in front of the school. It was too many of us to just don't stay in front of the school. It was, how many of you were out there on the picket line? Did you? Yeah, okay, so you know what I'm talking about. That was really, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and the food that parents brought, oh my God. <laughs> Teachers told me that they had to go on diet <laughs> after the strike because they were fed continuously. Not just donuts, oh my God. I saw, I saw at, um, it was in the Southeast, I saw at uh, Carver Middle School, parents brought a, a coffee urn that they ran a line from the school to throw me <laughs> And then they had a barbecue, and they were barbecuing lunch for the teacher. Uh, I mean, it was just unbelievable. So, so what does that mean? That means that we are in a situation now, for the first time in a very long time, when not just in California, and not just in Los Angeles, but all over the country, people are beginning to say, you have messed with our kids for too long, yeah. And it is time for you to stop giving more money to the fabulously wealthy and tax them and put some of it back into our kids and our schools. So that's really what this race is about. It's about developing an ability to go to Sacramento and to say to them, now let me tell you a couple of things before I go to, go to Sacramento. When Prop 13, before Prop 13 passed, I was in school here in this state, in Southern California. We didn't ever worry about whether our class sizes would go above 30. We never worried about whether there would be a nurse. You know, many of you are my age, you know that. Wherever you went to school, these were not our concerns. We didn't worry if there was going to be a librarian. We didn't worry about whether there were going to be counselors. We didn't worry about whether there would be extracurricular activities or music or art in the curriculum. We didn't worry about any of that. So Prop 13 comes along, and it undoes that. It undoes that. And it takes us from being in the top five in the country in per pupil expenditure down to 43rd. Actually, we were down to 49th for a while. We moved all the way up to 43rd. Okay. We spend about $12,000 a year on the kids here. New York spends $22,000 a year. Okay. Our economy, United States, China, Japan, Germany, if California were a country, we'd be the fifth richest country in the entire world. So why are we so underfunded? Prop 13 had another part, a two-thirds vote on taxes. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, we have all managed to send two-thirds to Sacramento now. For the very first time in my lifetime, there are two-thirds in the Assembly, there are two-thirds in the Senate, now, this is a assignment I'm going to give all of you. I want you on Friday to be going to your state assembly office and your state senator's office, and I don't care who they are, and I don't care if you like them or not. I want you to go on Friday to groups of three to five every Friday and say to them, we gave you two-thirds. You had an excuse for not raising taxes on the wealth because you couldn't. Now you can. If you are not willing to do it, we will find a Democrat to run against you who is willing to do it. And that's the message. <laughs> Don't applaud. After we're done, work together. Pick a Friday. Start doing this immediately. I need you to do it rather than to applaud doing it. Okay? It's very important because really, that's how we're going to change education in California. We're going to tell them it's time to be first and to fifth again. Because we have 150 billionaires living in California. We have tens of thousands of multi-millionaires living in California. I don't want to tax their income, they hide their income. I want to tax their wealth, their holdings, all right? And even a small percentage, one or two percent, generates enormous amounts of money. Because 2% of a lot of money is a lot of money. <laughs> so that's our message. Our message is to them we need an oil depletion allowance. You know? They're taking oil out every day. 
they, we get, the state gets not a nickel, 100% of oil depletion should go to K-12. We need to tell them it's time to go back to when I was at Cal Berkeley and there was no tuition. Yeah. Yeah. No tuition. Yeah. No, I left without debt, no tuition. All right, Cal State, CSU, community colleges, all were free. They need to be free again. Again, remember, fifth richest economy in the world. See, we're not talking about places where they don't have a tax base that they could do these things. But we know we do because California's economy was smaller relative to its population than it is now. It's actually larger now relative to the population than it was when I was young. So the fact of the matter is, plenty of money here, and we want them to tax it. Okay, we want them to tax it, and we want them to put it into schools for children. That's number one. Second thing I want. Written that somewhere down. Yes, we can just. Where is it? Yes, it's on my website under issues. Uh, if it isn't, it will be. I've been doing them, so I don't know if they're all up yet. My website is. Yeah, my website is Jackie Goldberg, all one word, dot org. And you should be able to find a lot of it there, or on my Facebook, which is Jackie Goldberg for School Work on your Facebook. Uh, and if they're not there, they're coming, because we've been recording them. I've been recording them verbally, and I've also been writing them, so that people have this information. Because, you see, the goal of my election is, is that I always hire organizers as my staff. And the goal of my election is to actually organize all of us who have been dying to get funding back to public education, all of us who are out with the teachers, and the teachers, and the rest of the community that cares about children, and to go back to Sacramento. And I say go back to Sacramento because when I was on the school board the first time, we took the Ambassador Hotel from Donald Trump. I know. There is no Ambassador Hotel today because of LA Unified School Board and, and, and my efforts and followed by me, Jeff Horton's efforts. So that's now a community school with UCLA involved. And it's a fabulous place. And why, how did we get the state to give it to us instead of to Donald Trump? We took almost 400 people to Sacramento in a car caravan. And we surrounded the building and went into every room. We're going to do that again now about them raising taxes on the wealth of this state. So stay tuned. Once I'm elected, I'm going to be calling on all of you to pick a time when you can take some time and to drive up in this enormous caravan that we had last time. It took us, oh boy, it took us about 10 hours to get there. Um, and people found places to stay with other people, and some of us slept in our cars. Uh, and, but we did it. We did it. And when we went into that room of the State Allocations Board, we won it. And you know who were the two people who helped us the most were? Mike Bruce, who was an assembly member. And Maxine Waters, who was in the yeah. yeah. Those two, those two carried it in the state allocation board. Okay, so we can do that again now about funding, but we need you before we go up there. We need you to already warn your assembly member and your state senators that we're coming by going to visit them on Friday. Okay, so now what changes do I want to happen in the charter legislation? Well, the first thing is that all charter schools must submit their budgets to the County Office of Education annually. When they don't, you end up with people like the Celerity Woman who stole money, about $2 million from her kids. Uh, you end up with uh, the Gulan guy, uh, you know, basically funding opposition in Turkey with money from charter school money. I mean, that's what he's doing. You have charter schools in Los Angeles who use their money to start charter schools in Ohio. This, all this should be illegal. I mean, I'm sorry. It's just we're not here to help you have enough money to have an empire of charter schools. Okay, that's number one. Your, 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 your stuff, your money has to be looked at every year. Secondly, we have to change the definition of an empty classroom. Right now, an empty classroom is a computer lab. That's an empty classroom. A uh, reading lab is an empty classroom. The library is an empty classroom. A music room that doesn't have classes in it six periods a day is an empty classroom. A uh, math lab is an empty classroom. If you have two parent rooms, one of them is an empty classroom. All right. Why does that matter? Because the charter schools, when they put on the ballot to change the vote for school bonds at the local level down from two-thirds to 55%, they snuck into Prop 39 the co-location idea. 
Okay, so here's what co-location means. Co-location means that you have a school, and I just described what are empty classrooms. So if you have empty classrooms, a charter school can go to the district and say, we want our school on the same campus as that school there. Mm -hmm. All right, we want all those empty classrooms. And Prop 39 says they are entitled to those empty classrooms. Now, if there are truly empty classrooms, that's a different story. But if what we're doing is taking away resources from kids at their school and then giving those resources to a different group of people, that's wrong. And we've got to change that. You should not lose your computer lab only to find out that the co-located charter school is using it for a computer lab and telling parents if their kids want to use the computer lab again, they have to leave their school and go to the other side of the campus and be a part of the charter school. That's wrong. That should not happen. That's not a part of having a system in which two groups work together. So that's the second thing we need to change is the definition of an empty classroom. We also need to have conflict of interest be built into the charters. Because right now, a yeah, let's say this front row right here, you're a charter board, okay? You can pay your superintendent for a school of 300 kids $400,000. Absolutely legal, all right? You could decide that you have a building you want to rent for that charter school, and you don't have to go out to bid. You don't have to peg it to market value. We can have, your charter board can pay you any amount of money per square foot that they choose to. Out of taxpayer salary. All of it, all of it, 100% are taxpayer salary. You could have a food, the nephew who does food services. You could pay your nephew any amount of money to bring lunch onto campus. Anything you want, there are no conflict of interest. There's no requirement that you go out to bid. There's no requirement that it has to be the lowest responsible bidder. That's where the money is, okay? Now, do all charter schools do this kind of crap? No. Some of them don't do it at all. Some of them do, but there's nothing to prevent anyone from doing it. And there should be a law against it. They should have to go out to bid. They should have to respect taxpayer money the same way every other public institution has to, and there has to be conflict of interest laws. So I'm working now with the legislature. Uh, Tony Atkins, who's the pro temp, has endorsed me, and she knows that I'm working on this with her. And Rendon, uh, who is the Speaker of the Assembly, didn't endorse me, but he represents yeah. Southgate, where this is, where this, where this is a big issue for the first time. Southgate is being inundated with charter schools. And so now he's under pressure from his own constituents, as well as from me. And so he's agreed to try to appoint a select committee that will look at the 26 years of charter legislation. So we're moving on that. The third area I'm moving on is that you all remember when we voted on the millionaire's uh, tax for health, mental health? Well, the county of Los Angeles is still sitting on a pile of dough. And they, uh, during the strike, they agreed to do something with psychiatric social workers. But I've been talking with Hilda Solis, who's endorsed me, and Sheila, who's endorsed me. And I've asked them to consider developing an actual school district-wide plan for the county in which they invest substantial amounts of psychiatric social work services on the campuses so that they are there during the day and they have a different group that comes in the late afternoon for the families because we have serious mental health issues in a society that treats people as mad badly as our society treats so many people. And when that happens, that trauma shows up at schools and then we think discipline and throw people out and suspension. We, we, we've had 50 years of knowing that that doesn't do any good. And now we talk about restorative justice, but we don't teach the teachers how to do it, which is another thing I'm going to make sure we do, because it's a good idea, but if you don't know what you're doing, it's just a good idea. It doesn't actually happen. So that's another issue that I'm working on, is to get psychiatric social workers at least one full-time one at every low-achieving school, and maybe two. And then as the achievement level goes up, the number of hours goes down, but at every school. These are things we can actually accomplish. We can do this, but I have to get elected. So I'm going to take your questions in just a second. But I want to just say to you, there are three things that we need help with because the election is March the 5th. That's about 10 days away. We need money. Uh, I'm third now in money by a lot. <laughs> 
Uh, but that's all right, because I've actually never had the most money in any election I've been in, and I've never lost an election. So the second thing is why. We have 800 volunteers. All right? But, but not everybody's available all the time, and we only have one weekend left and then get out the vote day. So we need you to sign up to do some precinct walking if you can. If you can't, we need you to make phone calls or text. We need you to contact using your own methods, everybody that you personally know who live in Board District 5, because it's like a secret election. Nobody votes in March. A whole bunches of people, even we're knocking on doors, we still find these are always voters whose doors we're knocking on. They vote every election. They still say to us, well, I didn't know there was an election coming up. Because, you know, I mean, really, you just don't know it's March the 5th, who votes in March. So anything you can do to talk to people you personally know, and let me tell you where the district is. It's Northeast LA first, so that's Eagle Rock, that's Highland Park in Mount Washington, it's um, Los Feliz, it's Echo Park in Silver Lake, it's East Hollywood, it's uh, Atwater, Glassell Park, Elysian Valley, and then it's kind of goes weird and it looks a little bit north of El Sereno, the northern end of El Sereno, touches the very edge of just one few blocks in East LA and goes down and now it's at Vernon, Cudahy, Southgate, Huntington Park, Bell, Bell Gardens. Now why is it like a telephone, two balls and then connected? Because when it was created after a, cons a census, there was no board district where a Latino had a very opportune time to win. And so it was created for that purpose. And I understand that, and I take that very seriously. But in a two-month election, none of the folks, and there are a couple of really good people running, I mean that quite sincerely, they haven't got a prayer mm -hmm. because nobody knows them. Nobody's ever heard of them. Okay. So what is the race like? There are 10 of us. <clears throat> the top three are all white women. Uh, Heather Repenning is being supported by the mayor. She has the most money and the most uh, the most independent expenditures, and they're spending one hundred and twelve thousand dollars against me. And no background in education. No, actually, the LA Times really kind of took her apart in its endorsement uh, of, of, uh, of of Cynthia Gonzalez, whom I love. I love Cynthia Gonzalez. If she had a prayer, I wouldn't have even entered the race. But she has no chance at all. So what's happening is, is that Heather's beginning to get worried that she might not make the runoff. Uh, and so she's worried that a Latina from Huntington Park named Graciela Ortiz might beat her. So she calls up, has somebody from her campaign call up Cynthia Gonzalez and offer her to get her an independent expenditure to help her because she wants her to depress uh, uh, Mark Costello Ortiz vote in the southeast, and you know what Cynthia Gonzalez said? No, thank you. Oh, okay. yeah. I mean, she's, she's that good. She says, no, nah, I'm not playing that game. I'm not into that. So, so well, it probably depends on how it was done. It could be a campaign violation. It could have been somebody who was in the IE made the offer and had not know anything about it. We don't know. We just don't know. But it's not independent. It's, it's not that's right. That's right. Not independent. Okay, so, so, but that tells you something. So what's happening is, is that everyone knows I'm gonna come in first and buy a lot. What they don't know is whether I can win it on March the 5th. And that's really our goal, because if I don't, whoever is second is gonna get at least $10 million in charter money. Yeah. They just are, that's what they do. I mean, they spent $40 million on Marshall Todd. I mean, really, on a state superintendent's race, $40 million, that's unbelievable. It tells you, though, how much money is at stake in all of this and why these billionaire privatizers are all working on. The final thing I want to tell you about is, is that this portfolio plan that they're planning to do is why Oakland teachers are on strike because they're planning to close 24 Oakland schools, a high school, uh, seven middle schools, and 17 elementary schools because with Jerry Brown's help because he had his own charter schools in Oakland. Uh, they have undermined open, but utterly and completely. And so that's why they're on strike. They're saying, no, you just can't take away Oakland Unified School District and make it a charter district. That is the goal here in LA, is to take away LA Unified and make it a charter district. 
And the way they do it is with this plan in which they give you three years to get your scores up a certain height and all of this other stuff. It's all based on scores. And if you don't do it, uh, your school is closed and the charter school is off of it. And that's what's coming down. Now, Butner pretends he doesn't know that that's what his plan is uh, because Scott Schmerlson on the board keeps asking him for what his plan is. And he keeps saying, I don't know that you're talking about a portfolio plan. On the other hand, we have documents that show that he's been talking with all of the people who did portfolio plans in Newark and Atlanta and in Chicago. So if he's not doing it, why is he spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on contracts for them? And he is going to do it, but he doesn't know if he can do it quickly enough before I get there. So, <laughs> so that's what we have to worry about. So basically what I need from you is money, time, between now and Tuesday the 5th, and then to come to the victory party. <laughs> okay. Okay, Jackie, thank you. Now question. Question. Jackie, get the first one. Thank you. Um, comment on two items. One, you mentioned Prop 13. You mentioned Prop 13, and then you talked about um, Jackie Well. You know. uh, the commercial real estate aspect of Prop 13. Comment on that. And the second thing is in the Oakland strike, uh -huh. as well as what's going on in other parts of the Bay Area and across the state, affordable housing, uh -huh. or lack thereof, uh -huh. is pushing teachers away from their communities. And out of teaching. And out of teaching. Literally out of teaching. I meant to both of those things. The, the thornier issue of first thing, the second one. Okay. The, okay. The, first, the first one uh, about the, the split role was going to yeah. be on the 2020 ballot. And what it will do is it will say, if you are a homeowner and you're living in your home, nothing's going to change for you. But for commercial real estate, we're going to raise the taxes more like their actual wealth. And let me give you an example. Disneyland, yeah. who's been paying the same property taxes since 1978, hasn't changed. But have the tickets gone up in price since 1978? <laughs> And when you go to the oil pumps, the oil farms down in Romina, storing all that oil, paying 1978 property taxes, do you pay the same amount when you go to the pump as you did in 1978? I don't know. So it's time for those of whom have gotten extremely wealthy on the wealth of this state to put something back, and that will be on the ballot, and we all need to work for it because there'll be a lot of money against it by the people who don't want to pay any more taxes. So Although it's interesting, there's probably going to be as many businesses in favor of it as wow. against it, and here's why. They came after 1978, and they're competing against companies that get the tax break that they don't get. They, some of them actually sued and lost that court case, uh, and, but they're going to be helping to fund the yes on the proposition, which I think is kind of interesting. Now, in terms of the housing, that, of course, in particularly the Bay Area is a problem, but it's getting to be a, a Los Angeles area issue as well. We have folks in low-income neighborhoods who are paying $2,000 a month for rent for a one-bedroom, not in great condition apartment. Yeah. So that means that for teachers at the low end of the salary schedule, in Oakland it's like about $42,000, a starting teacher salary, literally you can't afford to live in Oakland. But the worst thing is, you not only can't afford to live in Oakland, you can't afford to live anywhere else near your school. And so teachers are literally leaving teaching. Or some of them are driving Uber or Lyft at night after they've taught all day, which I haven't been a teacher, I don't know how anybody does that. But So that's a real problem. So we, we have a governor who says he's putting uh, $1.75 billion into housing. We have the housing measures that were passed here locally. Now that needs is pressure to actually get doing it because what's happening in Echo Park is they're building tons of housing, but it's all market rate. A hundred percent of it's market rate. And that's a ridiculous. We don't need any more market rate housing. Well, some people are arguing that if you have a lot more market rate housing, it will lower the prices of housing. So far, that has not been my lifetime experience. Uh, so if that happens, it will be for the first time in my lifetime. So what we need to be pushing, there is actually money at the state and the local level. We need to be pressuring them to spend it, to get it done. And that's really, that's really all we can do right now. But we have a governor who says this is important to him, so we have to hold him to his word. One, two, three. So Jackie, you were talking earlier about the oil severance. Yeah. 
and you were suggesting that all of that money, and I, I believe we should have an oil service tax like the state of New Mexico right. and other states. Right. Have. Alaska, uh, 12,000 bucks a person. There you go. Uh, but uh, I think that a portion of that uh, revenue really needs to go to transitioning to renewable energy and getting off of fossil fuel because that's the, the fossil fuel is generating that, uh, that tax. Yeah, so I know I'm, I'm not worried that it 100% has to go. But I'm trying to say, though, if we don't get up to around twenty dollars or $25,000 a kid, you can't get there from here with the kids who are the lowest achieving kids. Well, I don't want to get there. Yeah. I just think that okay. Well, I'm not going to write it. I'm not there anymore. So when they get ready to write it, you give them a call and make sure a portion of it goes somewhere else. Number two is over here. Yeah, so somebody said it. I could ask that I moved here moved here 35 years ago uh, and joined up with Jackie doing adult literacy work. Oh and yes. There, oh yeah. We actually they were all activists. Yeah. They were on the board already. Right. right. Um, I, I remember that promise we put out. You were making the peanut butter sandwich. Yes. Yes. I guess yes. the sense is we put the relish in her house. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. People have And we do. Uh, yes. yes. People have known what Jackie did in the after the school boards, living wage, community benefits. We'll work on my new rights. A lot of issues that are like yeah. just right at our heart here in this room. Jackie was there long before anybody else. Um, and so I know that you, what, it, what it means you'll be an activist back in office. My question, and you are my favorite elected progressive. Uh, thank you. Yeah. One of my favorites. Yeah. My favorite that I'm not married to. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is um, it seems like the strike in Los Angeles and around the country is a real inflection point. Absolutely. Um, is there a chance that, especially when you're elected, that the new superintendent's whole agenda is now untenable? And do you think that he can possibly, you know, continue to lead this district? Or are there still too many people that the charter people got on the board? I think, I think Vladimir is the key to that. He voted for Butner. Uh, and he's sort of gone to the dark side. He's been voting with the charter people regularly. I'm hopeful that my being on the board will influence him to come back to the lighter side of things. Also, Kelly Gohm has, has, and I have talked a little bit. I think she has a desire to be a good board member. I really do. Uh, she was not completely in the charter stuff. She got it kind of absentmindedly when UCLA didn't uh, help the person that she was running against. Um, so I think there are two people to try to get one vote. And we're going to try to get one vote. I'm not going to go in and say I'm going to get rid of Butner. Because a superintendent does what the board tells it to. Mm -hmm. And if he, if we can change what we tell him to and then he doesn't do it, we will automatically have four votes to get rid of him. So what has to happen is we have to come together, at least four of us, and give him direction as to what we want him to do. And uh, I'm hopeful that we'll find a fourth vote to do that. We've got three. Schmerlson and McKenna and I are in lockstep. So it's a matter of whether we can get either Kelly Gomez or um, or uh, um, Vladimir to join us. If we do that, we can get we can move the district in a different direction. And then if Butner's not interested in leading in that direction, that's when we talk about whether he can stay or not. But I don't go on with the idea of get rid of Butner. No, I was asking whether his agenda yeah. would still be sustainable. I don't think his agenda it has a very easy time once I get there, which worries me that he might try to move on it before I get there. Uh, you were three. Um, so you got your hands full with primary and secondary education right. already. Right. Can you talk about preschool for a second? Sure. Because oh, and there's money, money, money. Finally. Right. So finally. as as so even in Santa Monica, we're seeing these models of like private yes. public private yes. partnerships yes. in preschool yes. because there's no money for yes. preschool yet. Yes. yes. How do we avoid, or what role do you see for yourself and your board in in predicting and sort of staving off? an entrenchment of private money in yeah. public preschools mm -hmm. before we get it funded? That's, very, that's a very good question. I don't have a very good answer. Uh, it mostly is going to rely on the folks who have been for a long time preschool advocates yeah. uh, to go out to the boards, not just ours, but Santa Monica's board, I mean all of the boards, and say to them, you have an opportunity to apply for money now from the state from this. Here's how we want you to do it. We do not want these partnerships, which we had to do when there was no money. There's money now. We want these to be public institutions. It will really, you'll get other people to support you, and certainly I will on our board, and I think we probably will even get four votes on our board for that. But
but it does take those who have this as their goal, their heart, their soul, to really organize an advocacy, really in every district. Because that will influence what the legislators do in terms of writing the legislation that goes with the money he's getting. Right. See, there's three steps. He put money aside, but there's no legislation with it yet. Yeah. So now we have to have people like you who are familiar with all of the pieces of this and what it should look like be talking to Governor Newsom's staff by email about what your concerns are and to get a whole bunch of other people all throughout the state if you're all connected, and I think some of you are, uh, with these early child education advocacy organizations to be literally talk about what you want that legislation that, to look like. For example, at first he was not talking about upgrading the child care training or their salaries. I've been pushing him on that. He's now talking about it. Will he do it? I don't know. But what I'm saying is he, he's new. New people listen better than people who've been there a long time. Not always, but often. And so when he's new, now's the time to be writing him and saying, thank you for the money, but now the legislation is critical. And then send a copy of that to the president, pro tem of the Senate, Tony Atkins, and a copy of that to Rendon in the assembly. Because what you want to do is influence the legislation before it's written. After it's written, it's very much harder. Yeah. Okay, next. Hi. Um, Jackie, first of all, thank you. I mean, you thank you for all those ballot recommendations over the years. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, my question, yeah, you're so brilliant on the, the specifics of what's before you. I have an underlying question. I went for 12 years of Catholic education. I learned all about the history of setting up the Catholic schools in America. That was like one of my mother's bills. <laughs> I had the impression that the charter school movement was connected to all that yes. sort of right wing yes. Christianity yes. in the beginning. Now yes. you're telling me it's all about the money now. They well, don't even care. But the two have joined, joined together. That's what I thought. The two have joined together. So in some That's in Betsy DeVos's. Yes. She's yes. out yes. of the right wing Christian. But it's, it's like, oh, there's that. What, what would happen if an unpopular religion tried to set up uh, a uh, charter school? Actually, they have. Who are uh, us? Yeah. Okay, less popular even than yeah. Ruan. I mean, like chanting, like the, I thought you would chant your yeah. holy book, and they would say, this is our public school no, here right. now. Well, how is that not actually, <laughs> here's, here's how they're, some of the religious groups are doing it in California. They pay for their once private religious school daytime program, and they do religion at 3 o'clock on. Okay. And so they claim that it has nothing to do with it. However, if they're using the same building, oh, it's still illegal. So that's something that the district, our district has been terrible in looking at the charter errors. Let me give you two examples, okay? First example, seven school, new charter schools opened up this year. None of them, not one of them, came close to meeting the number of students that they thought they were going to have, but they got advanced money for all of it. The district will never go after that money. So they get to just keep the money, and the kids didn't show up. Well, when I get there, we're going after every dollar. Yeah. Then there are schools that who are co-located who are supposed to pay 3% of their gross from the state for rent to the district, who aren't paying it. We're not going after that money. We are soon to be going after that money. In other words, the district has not bothered to collect money owed it by the charters when they have not the number of students that they get paid for. And uh, that's because under the last one, Deasy, the charter school was run, the office of the district was run by people who used to run charter schools. Okay, so they, they don't bother collecting money owed to the district. And so that's going to change. But they're making money. But they're making, mo they're making money because they're not even taking, the kids aren't even showing up. 33% of all the charter schools in LA Unified, 33%, that's a third of them, all of them, are under-enrolled by 25% or more. Because when you have an unlimited amount of charters and a limited number of students, all of the schools are under-enrolled practically. The district schools and the charter schools. Because an unlimited number of anything is a stupid idea and it should not be legal. You should be able to tell a charter school, we have enough of you, you'll have to wait till one closes till we open another one, yeah. okay? Yeah. You have to be able to tell them they can't circle Crenshaw High School. They circled Crenshaw High School, all right? 
Crenshaw High School, built for 3,000 students, has 800 students today. All right? And the charter schools around it also were under-enrolled because there are six of them, right? The district could not tell those charter schools they can't locate there. The law says they can locate wherever they want. So without that ability to say, no, you can't circle a school and empty it out, none of the schools in the area has a full high school program because all the charters are also under-enrolled. Yes. So I am not involved in the charter. I wrote an article out that says the neighborhood schools and the public charters banned. Um, because my idea is that every kid should be able to walk to the neighborhood right. school. Right. And when they make these charter schools, what happens is the parents who know how to fill out a form, they fill out the form, and even in the, 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 the deepest ghetto of this country, there's still a tier system. Oh, there yeah. are parents who can fill out a form and there are parents and can who can drive their kids to and the can school. get their kids to the school. So what happens in these neighborhood schools, these poor little kids, and it breaks my heart, I still remember some of them, who would have been stuck there. Uh, they're, they're there and, and they don't have pencils and they don't have paper. Yeah. And the other kids are getting bused or driven out of the area and these kids are left with the teachers who, who maybe are dedicated, but they don't have any materials, they don't have anything. Yeah. And, and the it breaks my big. heart, and I think part of the, the strike was about making community Absolutely. schools. Every Absolutely. kid should be able to walk to a school. I agree. That's one thing. The other thing is, if you want to read about the open shows, the Jacobin has an incredible article. Oh, okay. They feel like Rose involved with it. They oh, yeah. involved in oh, yeah. the whole, the whole nine It's yards. about, it's a, and that's the and other news. And the headline says, they're, they're striking over money. What? They're not striking No, they're money. striking about their schools. <laughs> yes. Hey, so question about learning models. I don't know if it's an appropriate question sure, or not. Sure, go ahead. But, um, you know, basically, the standard learning model is child sits in desk, listens to a teacher lecture, and learns. But I'm not, not in elementary. Elementary is better than that. Okay. We don't want high school as a model. Right. So what, I'm just wondering, like, are there any possibilities on implementing well, we are having a significant increase in the number of teachers able and been trained in project learning, which is a very good system. Not good for everybody, but good for a lot of kids, and certainly a lot more interesting than most. Uh, we have a lot of schools that are working on changing their curriculum to include more arts education. Even though they don't get funded for it, they're finding a way to use existing teacher resources to do that, or sometimes community resources. You have uh, some schools that are partnering with neighborhood organizations. We have some school-based health clinics that I put on when I was on the board the first time, and we're expanding those opportunities to more schools. So, yeah, it is. I will say this. Um, people teach the way they were taught. Um, and you can change that. You can, by working with them, but that's really it. So one of the things when I spent the eight years at UCLA was I tried to teach them the way I wanted them to teach their students mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't have them do the traditional things of a course that I was working with them in. It is difficult to make those changes because the way schooling has been has been the way for a long time. But it's not impossible and it is happening. And it's not just happening in charter schools, because charter schools once were more innovative than they are now. Yeah. Now they've gone to teaching to the test because they advertise that our scores are higher than your neighborhood school, come here. Mm -hmm. So for a while they weren't doing that. They were actually trying to lead the way to other ideas. And we've lost a lot of that, because what they're worried about now is there's competition for enrollment even between charter schools, mm -hmm. much less charter schools in the district, and so when they're under-enrolled, what's happening is, is this teaching to the test has become enormously more important again, and it's one of the things I want to get rid of. We spend too much time teaching for tests that really, frankly, are meaningless. <laughs> and money. Yeah. Oh, lots of money. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of money. Then, then, and then. What connection, if any, do you see between the charter school movement and the anti-union movement? Oh, they're very connected. They're very connected. Betsy DeVos is, believes that unions should be illegal. Uh, I mean, she actually does. She believes they should be illegal. She should be illegal. Yeah, really. <laughs> she, uh, she, she connected up with, in, in the northern uh, um, Midwest states, she connected up with the right-wing re religious zealots. 
And so she's got this voucher program that anybody can get in her state. Uh, that's what she wants to do nationally, is to simply say that you just get money and you can go to any school you want, including a right-wing religious school that says there was no evolution, for example. That's that's what she wants to do with it. Uh, so, so the fight really is to say to people that we have a separation between church and state, and we're going to insist on that, and it doesn't matter where it is, yeah. if it's public money, yeah. if it's public money, it's coming out of your pocket and mine, <laughs> it's, uh, it's going to be used only for public school sources. Which, okay, yes. But, so I have two, I have two uh, questions. The first one is, um, Serrano Priest, is yeah. it still the law, and yes. when was the last time anyone did a compliance review on it? Serrano Priest was a, a, a legislative fight that I was particularly into because in Compton we had a small tax base, and our students were getting much less than the kids in LA Unified. Um, and it was a lawsuit that said that really it shouldn't matter what your zip code is, you should get from the state at least the same amount of money. Uh, and therefore the schools wouldn't have uh, higher income schools like Beverly Hills with great tax base, getting more per kid than um, uh, Compton or LA. Uh, so that was found to be enforced, at, but here's what they did. When they did that, they made all things having to do with average daily attendance. And they knew when they did it on the basis of average daily attendance that kids in low-income neighborhoods attend less often because they don't have health care, they don't have dental care, their parents have to move because they can't pay the rent several times a year, and they get evicted. And so what's happened is, is that there is still a discrepancy between what everybody's getting, but it's based on ADA, and so they pretend that it's neutral and that it has nothing to do with race and class, and it has everything to do with race and class. And fundraising isn't included, it's only nothing. state money. only state money. Okay, and then the other question... But nobody's done a research in a while, and that's a good yeah. point, and I think we should ask them to do that. About 20 years, yeah, I, think I think, since the last review. And then the other thing is, I understand that there are homeschool charter schools yes. where they get the full yes. amount from the state, yes. And then they give parents a couple of thousand yes. dollars yeah. to go out and enrich their children. I know. And doesn't that seem like a gift of public funds? It certainly that, does. That should be illegal? It should it be not? illegal. It's one of the things we're looking at in the charter school amendments. We're also looking at on, on clamping down on the online charter school. We had one charter school we're online in the state that said that everybody was present every day whether they signed in or not. And they were they were yeah. getting the, the full, same ADA. Full, full ADA. Go ahead. What are your thoughts on um, reducing violence in public schools? The like best and, the, and schools in general. I the guess. best way to reduce violence is uh, three things: raise the minimum wage. That's number one. Every time we raise the minimum wage anywhere, academic scores go up in low income yeah. neighborhoods. One hundred percent of the time, not fifty percent of the time. Wow. One hundred percent of the time. So one of the best things you can ever do to raise achievement scores in low-income areas is to raise the minimum wage. I always start with that. Wow. Secondly, you get the county to uh, farm out psychiatric social workers on all of those campuses where you have a lot of kids living in traumatic situations for any reason, one reason or another. And you say that that's how we're going to deal with these issues because these issues represent problems that people are dealing with in their lives. We're not talking about bad kids. You gotta get rid of this good kid, bad kid, good school, bad school crap. These are all good kids, but they have more challenges and we need to be meeting those challenges. And then I do think if we can do um, uh, the kind of, 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 of thinking that, that, that they're talking about in terms of, um, thinking the phrase I've lost it. No, Re, uh, reconstructive, I don't know. Restorative, restorative justice. justice. That's a very good idea. The problem with it in LA Unified right now is, is that they did not spend the time and effort getting people prepared for it. So it's really a joke in many schools. In other schools, it's actually functioning. What is it? Restorative justice says that, okay, let's say that you socked her. Instead of putting you out of school, we bring you both in, and you have to explain to her why you socked her, and you have to tell her you're sorry, and if she needs some ice on it, you're going to go get the ice on it, and you're going to make sure at lunchtime that you hang out with her and see that she's okay, okay? Because you're restoring the error. You're not getting thrown out of school, uh, and, and you're getting someone who's not only going to tell you they're sorry, 
but they're going to help you for the rest of that day so that you feel better about the fact that you might have been injured. That's, that's the, it, it's the oversimplification, but that's the concept of it. And so what happens when we do that is, is that people need to be somewhat skilled in working out that relationship between these two students that just had a battle. And when we don't prepare people to do that, they don't do it very well, and then it doesn't work, and then they think, oh, it doesn't work. Well, yeah, it works, but it is a skill, and skills have to be learned. Okay. Um, we're running out of time? You are running out of time. Oh, you have a new I, place to go. I so, so I want to thank Jackie.